Hello folks, so I wanted to revisit a subject I addressed before, and that is the subject of whether or not creatine can cause hair loss. I have created some earlier videos where I have discussed this, but I have never taken the topic very seriously. I have always felt the fear about creatine causing hair loss was overblown, but nevertheless, creatine supplementation remains a subject of concern with many hair loss sufferers, and what prompted me to want to revisit this subject was a comment left on my channel by a Dr. Alan Bauman, who uh, referenced the study, which is commonly cited by those who are concerned with hair loss, so today I want to carefully go over this research research he cited, give my own opinion, and then hopefully leave you guys, my viewers, in a better position to make a decision for yourselves. So, first of all, what is creatine? Creatine is a non-essential amino acid, which means that our body produces it naturally. It plays an essential role in ATP hydrolysis, which is a biochemical process in the body where our body uses water to break down ATP, adenosine triphosphate, into ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and then generate energy. Creatine phosphate, which is the actual ingredient in creatine, reverses the process and helps rephosphorylize the ADP molecule and change it back into a new ATP molecule. So the theory, and remember, it's just a theory, is creatine supplementation will restore depleted ATP stores, which is a source of energy in our body, uh, specifically our skeletal muscle tissue, thus allowing an athlete to perform more work at the gym. It is found in certain foods, but not in quantities high enough for any kind of ergogenic benefit, but it is also available as an over-the-counter ergogenic aid to improve strength and muscle mass by improving an athlete's performance during strength training. Now, the unwritten rule when it comes to performance-enhancing supplements uh, in the world of fitness is that if something is legal, that means it probably doesn't work. But creatine is a notable exception as it's backed up by some fairly strong evidence that when incorporated with an effective strength training program, it will help increase strength and muscle mass in athletes who supplement with creatine, uh, more so than people who do not supplement with it. So there is a tremendous amount of data supporting creatine's use as an er ergogenic aid and I'll link a review article on this if you are inter interested. But the bottom line is that creatine does, in fact, seem to be beneficial to athletes. Speaking personally, though, I don't care for it that much, and I'm not disputing the evidence, uh, but I have never found any very much use for it. I mean, even when using large quantities like 25 grams or more daily, I didn't notice any real difference in my performance at the gym. I mean, maybe it helped my handle a little bit more volume, but nothing too significant. Like maybe I can handle just like one more set. And, you know, also I hate the texture and taste of it. I mean, for some reason it makes me gag. And I know you can buy creatine capsules, but oftentimes those are made out of gelatin. So as a vegan, I won't take them. Uh, again, though, that's just my own experience with creatine. I mean, I don't doubt the strength of the research behind it. So getting back on subject, we don't fully understand the mechanism or long-term safety profile of creatine supplementation, but it has been on the market for decades. And even though it is not FDA approved, if there were any known health risk, it probably would have been taken off the market by now. I mean, it is actually very common for over-the-counter performance enhancing supplements to be taken off the market. I mean, we've seen it with androgen derivatives like androstenedione, dione, as well as designer steroids like super droll. These compounds when sold as a dietary supplement don't actually need any FDA approval, but the FDA does have the power to take them off the market, but oftentimes the sales these products generate will offset any litigation costs they'll face from damages these products cause to individuals. And it's a real unethical system in my opinion, and it should be reformed, but the underlying point is the FDA doesn't mess around with this kind of thing. So if creatine were dangerous, it probably would have been pulled off the market long ago, maybe even decades ago. So let's take a look at the article Dr. Bauman referenced. So this is a study from 2009 that involved 20 male rugby players who are all young adults between the ages of 18 to 19 years old. There were 24 of them originally, but four dropped out. The athletes were not on any other supplements that could have influenced the outcome of the study, and during the study, they went through their standard training program, and these were already advanced athletes, keep in mind, so they weren't doing anything differently except for just the creatine supplementation. So the methodology was a double-blinded placebo-controlled crossover 
crossover study with a six-week washout period, and it measured serum testosterone and dihydrotestosterone, DHT, after 21 days of creatine supplementation. So what this means is that at the start of the study, half of the athletes received creatine and the other half of them received a placebo, which in this case was just a glucose capsule that the athletes were taking. Um, so both groups received treatment for three weeks, and then following that, there was a washout period where they received no therapy for six weeks. After that, the groups were swapped, meaning the ones that got placebo before were given creatine and vice versa. Again, there was a three-week treatment period, and then the study was over. And since it was randomized and double-blinded, neither the subjects nor the investigators knew who was on which treatment until the study was over. So overall, the methodology is good, with the only limitation so far being the sample size, meaning the number of subjects was relatively small, just 10 per group. So what they measured were serum levels of testosterone and DHT. They measured them before treatment, after one week of loading with creatine at 25 grams per day, and then after another two weeks of maintenance treatment with five grams per day. So the duration wasn't very long, but it was long enough to produce some interesting results. So the results didn't show any increase in testosterone, but they did show a pretty dramatic increase in DHT in the creatine group. Compared to the control group, which was just getting sugar capsules, keep in mind, the creatine group saw a 56% increase in DHT compared to baseline after the seven-day loading phase. Following that, they went on a maintenance phase where they just used five grams per day, and after two weeks of treatment, their DHT levels were not as high as with the loading phase, but still were 22% percent higher than baseline. As you might expect, since the testosterone levels didn't change and the DHT levels went up, the DHT to testosterone ratio also increased with creatine. So keep in mind, finasteride suppresses anywhere from 55 to 70 percent of DHT depending on dosing. So this would suggest that using creatine negates a big chunk of the DHT suppression that finasteride causes. So on paper, this makes creatine look extremely unappealing from the perspectives of someone who is fighting hair loss. So I fully understand why people would be apprehensive to start using it. Here are some things to consider though. We know that finasteride binds strongly to the 5-AR enzyme, so we don't know if creatine would cause the same rise in DHT in people who are on finasteride. These athletes were not on finasteride, and we know that for certain because the study checked for things that would influence the outcome of the study, and obviously finasteride would affect this outcome considering it lowers DHT. So considering that DHT's existence is contingent on the 5-AR enzyme and finasteride suppresses this enzyme, we don't know if finasteride users would experience the same rise or any rise for that matter in DHT with creatine. There is just no evidence for that. Another thing to consider is that this is a very short-term study and as people continued on creatine, the amount of DHT elevation decreased. Now this could be because they're on less creatine, but it's also possible that the effects of creatine on DHT might just be acute and wear off over time. Clearly, we would need a longer-term study to answer this, and as it turns out, there is a study in development, which I'll link, which is intended to look at the effects of six months of creatine on DHT levels. But even that study won't answer the question whether or not creatine interferes with the effects of finasteride. I mean, it could very well be that this increase, increase in DHT only happens because of normal 5-AR activity, so we can't assume there would be a similar proportional increase in DHT in people who are on finasteride or other 5-AR AR inhibitors like uh, dutasteride or episteride. Although, um, another thing I do want to emphasize, which I already talked about earlier, is how stringent the FDA is when it comes to nutritional supplements. I mean, I already mentioned androstenedione, dione and what that was was essentially a steroid der derived pro-hormone that was first sold in the USA in the mid-1990s, but it was then banned in 2004. So that's less than a decade, and the reason it was banned was because it was found to cause health problems commonly associated with steroid use, of which there are many, such as infertility, enlarged prostate, acne, reduced sperm count, shrunken testicles, gynecomastia, heart disease, erectile dysfunction, and liver toxicity, amongst many others. Now, creatine... Uh, shouldn't be compared to androstenedione dione directly. I mean, it's not hormonal in any way, but if it really did increase DHT significantly, then it would also be associated with the problems that come along with DHT. 
I'm not just talking about hair loss. I mean, keep in mind, DHT is a trash hormone. And if it really did elevate DHT, it wouldn't just cause hair loss, but it would also cause acne. It would cause enlarged prostate. It would help fuel diseases that potentially feed off of DHT like prostate cancer. Suppressing your DHT is beneficial in many ways, not just because it stops hair loss, but because DHT absolutely wrecks havoc on our body post-adolescence, that is, and I think if creatine really did raise DHT significantly in the long term, it probably would have been linked to some health problems by now. I mean, keep in mind, creatine's been around for a while. Creatine was first discovered, in fact, in 1835, and the first research trials were performed in the early 1900s. So we're talking about research done around the same time the Titanic sunk and the U.S. government was debating whether or not we should participate in World War I. I think if something like androstenedione dione could be pulled off the market in less than a decade, then certainly if creatine had any unlabeled effects, then it would have been pulled off the market after over a century of use. So another area of concern with people who are interested in creatine supplementation is that a lot of them are people who are just getting into the gym and they want to know whether or not the acute increase in androgen levels from strength training will adversely affect hair loss. The short answer to this is no. But the long answer to this is also no. Seriously, this is nothing to worry about because they have never been, there's never been any evidence whatsoever that exercise causes any kind of hair loss. Now, exercise is a stressor on the human organism. So if you're doing really, really intense exercise combined with other extreme lifestyle behavioral activities that are stressful on the body, such as crash dieting or the excessive use of stimulants, then it's theoretically possible that overtraining could contribute to telogen effluvium, which is a stress-related type of hair loss. But this type of hair loss is reversible, and it is easily distinguished from typical male, male pattern baldness, as it tends to be patchy and random, as opposed to occurring in the pattern typical with male pattern baldness, which is when it usually uh, it, start, it either starts on the temples or the crowns they meet. If you've ever seen the Norwood scale, then you know what I'm talking about. So although there are a number of studies that examine the effect of exercise on sex hormones, the bottom line remains that there are no studies showing that if you exercise, it's going to make your androgenic alopecia any worse. So it's true. You see a lot of bald people who are really, really jacked at the gym, but many of these bald people people, keep in mind, are steroid users, and steroids certainly cause hair loss. I mean, if you were to ask uh, any of these guys what caused their hair loss, I doubt any of them would blame it on their uh, creatine use. But beyond that, I don't think it's really even worth uh, speculating about. I mean, strength training has so many benefits uh, for both our mental and physical health that I think it's completely foolish to abstain from it out of fear that maybe, despite the lack of any evidence, is going to make you go bald. I mean, we know what will happen if you don't exercise. I mean, you'll end up looking like someone whose name I promised I wouldn't bring up anymore, but I think you guys probably know who I'm talking about, especially you guys who have been subscribed to me for a while. But um, <laughs> anyways, anyone who wants to claim that it causes hair loss, the burden of proof is on them. I mean, they want to show some real evidence with some actual data, then I'll go ahead and give it a good look. But until then, please dispense with all the slaphead propaganda and fear mongering when you have no evidence to back up your claims. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up and uh, I'm going to go play some Doom Eternal DLC because it just came out today or yesterday, I think, and I really want to play it over the weekend while I still have some time. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend, and I'll see you all next time. Take care.